Talks and Teasers, which is a program to bring our graduate students of interesting you know, journalism professionals. And I think besides some of our grad students, we maybe have some what, apprentices some of the here? apprentices. Uh -huh. Okay, excellent. And so, um, uh, well, help yourself. We have a little, uh, little sweets for you, some lemonade, some cookies. So if you want to get up and get some and before we uh, start the talk, it's going to be very informal. So let me introduce to you Lou Waters, who has been, well, he's retired now, but he has quite the um, career. Uh, well, beginning in Minnesota, but he was in Tucson as a journalist in 1970. Started the first FM station in the... Uh, yeah, well, it's now when I was, when I was seven point five. I, uh, yeah, and then also, too, um, then, then it wore off in his um, to Honolulu, to San Francisco, came back to Tucson, worked for KDOA, and from there was scooped up by a little new enterprise called CNN uh, in 1980, and he was an anchor seen as since the time it was on the air, until, and this is intriguing, um, and, and, uh, until September 2001. Well, so, a little bit beyond that. Oh, okay, okay, I was wondering. <laughs> I, I figured that the news would begin getting serious. Yeah. <laughs> and it did. Ah, uh, <laughs> um, and, and see, in between all that, you have reported everywhere from um, China to well, every I, continent? I, I, uh, Politics, Reagan's uh, assassination attempt. Oh, so much. Seen it all. So much. So, news. without further ado, I will let you tell them about it. And we'll leave some. We'll talk, go to about three thirty, and then we'll have some time for a few questions uh, and answers. So, um, again, thanks all so much for coming, Lou. Especially thanks to you for coming to talk. So, uh, I'm really uh, happy to be doing this, and it's not. Uh, rhetorical cliche, I really am happy to be doing this because I have been a journalist most of my life in many different venues and especially now I'm as frustrated as I imagine you must be about what you anticipate about the future of journalism. Um, I'm not going to talk about me uh, only to the extent that I think I've been where you are, only different. I was at the University of Minnesota studying architectural engineering. Um, my dad was an accomplished architect and a triple A baseball player, first base, a professional musician, super dad. I'm the oldest of four boys, and he wanted his oldest to be an architect. So I went to the University of, Arizona, uh, University of Minnesota, got four years in, and discovered I didn't want to be an architect. I didn't want to follow in that footsteps after I discovered campus radio. Now that may sound odd, but I was immediately hooked. It was a closed circuit campus station, but Paul Harvey, the famous newsman, had a program there, and local DJs and newsmen would come in, and they did a program called uh, the five-minute program that ran 10 minutes over time. And I watched these guys, and I said, I want to do that. My greatest frustration was realizing I, and my greatest fear was realizing I had to tell my dad that I didn't want to do what he wanted me to do. And it was, it was difficult. But when I got a job in Minneapolis radio for $5 an hour, I said, this is it. This is it. Very uncertain. If there's one thing I lacked, it was confidence and self-assuredness, and I had to, over time, build on that. <clears throat> so all I'm saying uh, to you is, um, I don't know what lies ahead for you, but there's going to be a lot of opportunities, and I encourage you to take advantage of every opportunity, even if it's $5 an hour. When I spoke to the freshman class, we had a Q&A at the end, and one fellow raised his hand. It was a second question. He said, I want to be an anchor. Um, you got any advice on what I could do to be an anchor? I said, yes. Be a reporter. Be a writer. Be a producer. Be a photographer. Be an editor. Be all those things. Because you don't know what opportunity you're going to run into. And you can jump into that opportunity 
and move ahead. It happened to me. I figure I lead a led a blessed life. From radio, I was told at the University of Minnesota that you can't get into radio because you sound a little like Alice Faye. And I did a little. I had a goofy voice. So I had to work on voice work. I had to work on, I minored in English, so writing is, uh, is, is a very big thing for me and a very big thing for journalists. And uh, I'm self-taught in that area. I studied uh, Edward R. Murrow and Edwin Newman and these guys, these writers, these people who knew what they were doing. And then I got into Tucson, put that radio station on the air, my last radio job, put that FM station on, Tucson's first. Then I wanted to get into television. They said, you can't get into television. You can't go from radio to television. I like being told what I can't do. So I went and did booth work. I went and did uh, photography for Channel 4. I wrote for them. I did, I did reporting. Love reporting. And by the end of, that was in 1970, by, the, by 1977, after a quick trip to the coast where I was hired as a reporter in San Diego, eventually became news director, came back to Tucson as news director, going, what the hell? Um, there are opportunities out there. They need people who have intention, ambition, confidence, all those things that you need to develop in the course. I don't know how many people are thinking of television or radio. Newspapers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to do a podcast this week with someone, a fellow who's had a, in Powell, Wyoming, he's, he's had a newspaper for 55 years and he's by his fingernails trying to hold on to it. Same thing with a lot of television, radio stations. Things are shrinking because there's too much of it. Now CNN played a large part in how we got to where we are, for good and ill. When I went to Channel 4, I was satisfied. I was a news director there. We were number one. Then I got a call from across the street from Channel 13, Jay Watson. He said, we've got you over here because we're going to do live television. This is 1978. <clears throat> John Ruby at Channel 4 was a friend of mine. I took him out front and I said, John, I'm going to resign because Channel 13 over here across the street has a satellite dish and they're going live. And he said, Tucson's not big enough for live television. I said, well, you may be right, but i got to take advantage of that satellite dish. I haven't done that yet. So I went over there. Later that year, a plane crashed in Tucson between the, the middle school on the right and the U of A campus on the left at noontime, both crowded school grounds. And this pilot, an A7D, flamed out, and he's pointing his playing down Highland to avoid these crowded schoolyards. He punched out at 400 feet, broke every bone in his body, and his plane hit a blue Honda with two female students in it on Highland Avenue. Those were the only casualties. Even the pilot who punched out lived. While I was at, we, our live truck was right around the corner. The police and fire said, come behind our lines. It's the first time I've been invited behind a police line ever. But we had parents were panicking. They plugged up the switchboards at the police department, fire department. Our kids are out there. So we used that live capability to the advantage of these parents. And then, before we even finished up there, I got a call from Rick Kaplan who was a later boss of mine, who was the lead producer for Walter Cronkite the CBS News New York. We want that story as our lead for tonight. I said, oh my god, another job. <laughs> so we raced back, we wrote the story, got the video, sent it off, they led with it. It was a, like 
three, two weeks later, I got a call while I was anchor. I don't look through anchor that much, but I always ended up back on the anchor desk. Uh, yeah, this is Sam Zellman. I'm the uh, recruiter for CBS television. We've been watching you for three days. And I said, who is this really? <laughs> and he told me, he said, God, let me take you out. Well, they offered me an anchor job in New York City, which I turned down. Came back to Tucson. This guy who came here, the recruiter, quit CBS and went with Ted Turner at CNN, Cable News Network, it was called in the beginning. That's his first executive. He said, well, how about, how about Atlanta? I said, well, we're going all live, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I said, OK, let me try that. So I went to Atlanta in April of 80, three months before we started. It was I told the cab driver, take me to CNN, the cable news network. It's at 1044 West Peach Street. Pouring rain, he pulls up in front of this clapboard house with broken <laughs> stairs. I said, This can't, I'm going, it's a television network. He said, Well, this is 1044 West Peach Street. <laughs> Maybe it's another Peach Street. I don't know if you've ever been to Atlanta, but it's Peach Street, everything. Peach Street, Canyon, Peach Street, Court, Peach Street. He drives me all around and ends up back at 1044 West Peach Street. And there's the recruiter standing in the doorway, <laughs> grinning at me. I go in there, we have a meeting, maybe a hundred people just jammed in there, sitting on the windowsills and chairs, wherever we could. It was our first meeting. You know what the big question was? How in the world can you fill 24 hours a day, seven days a week with television news? That was our question. That's, that's what we wrestled. And Ted Kavanaugh, one of the first producers, said, now if this doesn't work, folks, and the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, everybody said it wouldn't work. There's no market for it. I have a quote here from Christopher Byrd, who was with the Washington Post Company. He said, the cable industry doubts that Ted Turner knows his ass from a hole in the ground about news. In time, he's going ahead. his going ahead will help those of us who know better. Was that, that was all around us. You guys are here for a project, so excited, may not work. Kavanaugh says, if worse comes to worse, we can all get a job somewhere and hire each other. Because we were all, we were all producers, we were all writers, news directors, anchors, we, just a, less than 300 of us worldwide. And then we began, and it was, it was like going to summer camp, really, you know? And we thought, okay, to fail, to fail, but we're going to give it our all. Uh, the early indications happened in uh, 1981. The MGM Grand Hotel caught fire. It turned out to be a fire in the restaurant downstairs, but then it went up through the mullions in the construction of the hotel, just went swooping up. And because of my architectural background, <laughs> Ted Kavanaugh gave me one paragraph. He said, can you go on and give us two minutes on this? I said, yeah. So I sat on the anchor desk, and Kavanaugh kept going like this. <laughs> there was nothing. There was no phone call, and no video, no nothing. So I stretched the, because I'd been at the MGM Grand, knew a little about Vegas. This is when I discovered I had, my gift is, is spot news. I can call spot news, and I don't pat myself on the back, because I've told you about my self-confidence level, but I knew I could do this. When, while Kavanaugh's doing this, he's getting phone calls from nurses at nearby hospitals. I'm talking about casualties. Local television in Vegas started shooting their local video around back to their stations, and we scooped that video up. We stretched that into two and a half hours of coverage, including helicopter shots of the people who had to go to the roof to get evacuated because of the heat in the... And the, 
uh, lead producer came up to that person and he said, you know, I think we can do this. You can do television news 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There was a lot of repetition, but that was the first indication that, there, that we could do it if we did it right. And uh, by 1987, which was the biggest, we didn't make a dollar until 1985. We used to get calls saying, uh, Ted's got uh, your paycheck money uh, in a paper bag going across town, catch your check early. <laughs> it was that kind of thing. Ted Turner put his entire $40 million into this thing, and he was dedicated to making it work. By 1987, our highest rated program that decade was a little girl, 18 months old, fell into her aunt's well in Midland, Texas, and it took 58 hours to get her out. The initial call was to our Dallas Bureau, which was, <laughs> and we had a teaming staff of two there, uh, Tony Clark and the assistant. He said, well, we can't leave. I mean, we don't have, I said, we got on the desk with him and said, grab a camera, grab your assistant, get your butt to Midland, Texas. That turned into a worldwide story. I mean, journalists from all over the world came there. It was incredible. And that was our highest rated story. And then it just went from there, you know? We were in Beijing, I used to Tiananmen Square, watching that student uprising and resisted strongly when they tried to kick us out because we were broadcasting live. They were pinned. Remember the picture of the guy, the student in front of the tank? Mm -hmm. As soon as they got us out of there, they brought in troops. Some knelt, some stood behind them, and they massacred students. We held them off as long as we could. Then. Our reporters on the ground witnessed the shooting. We had no cameras there. And then they got to uh, satellite stations to flesh out that story of what happened. My, job, my, my life was radio, and I got to wind it up by doing spot news journalism, which included not only the Jessica McClure story, but in 91, the uh, first Persian Gulf War, I got the Columbine shooting, I got the Paducah school shooting, I got my first four reporting stories were the shuttle missions, the first five shuttle missions from the Johnson Space Center. So wow, I'm out of the office, I'm broadcasting live back to headquarters, wow. The I got to know all the astronauts, then the Challenger blew up. 1986, uh, I tried to call. I was sitting in my office, and I watched the thing go up, and after 73 seconds, it exploded. I went, we all went, oh my god. This was the Krista McAuliffe, mm -hmm. the teacher in space mission. Her parents, and this was a, a strenuous editorial decision we had to make. We had McAuliffe's parents down in, on the Cape, witnessing this explosion of the spaceship their daughter was on, and we debated whether or not to show that video. That's the care we took, not only with that story, but others. And they finally decided they would show that video, because that's, that's what was happening. But I was on the air for seven hours that day. It was the kind of thing where your next, you have your IFB, your next interview is sitting on, on your left, a, a teacher who, who worked with Krista McAuliffe, boom, interview. Next, John McCain's from in Washington, hi John, who was that, seven hours. And they call Walter Cronkite old iron pants. But, <laughs> From the way it started, I mentioned IFB. This is how you know digital television takes over everything, and that's what we were. We, but in the beginning, we didn't even have a computer in our newsroom. We had a guy named Rob Barnes, a good friend of mine, wonderful guy. 
He was building the computer for us while we were using Smith Corona like, uh, uh, typewriters to bang out multi-carbon copies of our scripts, which would feed through the uh, teleprompter. Thank God I was a live reporter, so I didn't have to do too much of that. One day I had someone who was deaf doing the teleprompter, and the teleprompter wasn't moving. I said, why? Well, he's deaf. I said, oh, maybe we should work on that. It was a strange time. But we did not have the IFBs. Our very first story was the Mariel boat lift. These were the Marielitos who were holed up, 10,000 of them, at the Peruvian embassy in Cuba. Arrangement was made between Castro and Carter to get them over here. So Mike Betcher, who from us went to NBC as a reporter, great reporter. In fact, he was my producer in the shuttle missions. He's down at the end of the pier in Key West. So pay phone at the head of the pier. They hired a Cuban boy to take a phone call from Atlanta. Blow your whistle. Okay, so the kid blows a whistle. The, the director down at the end of the dock with Betcher hears the whistle and cues him, you're on the air. <laughs> that process took seven seconds. In that time, Betcher's picture is up on TV and he's picking his nose. <laughs> that's how unsophisticated we were. That's how we ended up being called Chicken Noodle News uh, by Tom Brokaw and others. And we deserved it. But in the beginning, I swear to God, people tuned in to see that stuff. <laughs> My blooper wheel is about the same. <laughs> and that's what they saw. But, you know, and what have we got now? We've got the people in 91 who saw what happened with the Persian Gulf War saying, oh my God, it does work. They all jumped into it. So now we've got, what, six, eight cable news channels? Too much in the hands of too few. Now, I'm a constructive critic. I'm not, you know, I earn my living. I have great respect for journalists and I have great respect for the power of media, but things have gone a bit haywire. And uh, another quote, have you, have you heard of James Patterson? Five years, uh, five years, not five years ago, he wrote a book called Interesting Times. He's talking about the effect of CNN and cable news on the entire media structure, and he said, with all the news sources on the internet and cable TV, we have become more confused than ever about what is real and what is not, and people find their own reality. So the different Americans are dealing with a completely different set of facts when they're arguing about politics. My thing, I'm telling you about all the news stories I did, that's why I got into the business. But you look at MSP, MSNBC or CNN or during the day, they have panels, news panels. Yeah. We have, uh, we're not covering the news, we're talking to the Washington Post reporter who's covered the news. And over here we have an opinion columnist for the reporters and opinion given equal weight. I find that to be disturbing. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, in the CNN original days, uh, Ted Turner insisted we weren't celebrities, we were just journalists in the vineyard doing journalism, and that was reward enough. I mean, it was thrilling for me. Uh, the news was the star, he said. It was a simple philosophy. We interrupted heavy news for other news. We didn't mess around with opinions, things like that. We had one half hour program, which was called Crossfire. Patrick Buchanan, who was about as right wing as you can get, debated in little short clips. It was only 30 minutes long. Uh, Tom Braden, who was with the CIA, and he was a left-leaning person. And they did battle, and that was it. Now it's like an all-day crossfire. Um, that's just my opinion, and I'm not allowed those too often. But now that I'm retired, I can speak to you about them. <laughs>
Um, the panels drive me crazy. I'm just so frustrated, and that's why I thought with the Mueller report coming out next week, we could maybe tap that down a little bit. But after I left CNN, they began firing photographers. I said, that it is still TV, isn't it? Don't you need pictures? Do you see many uh, reports from out in the field on CNN? Or on? No, you don't. It's all talking heads. Why? It's cheaper, a lot cheaper. And the first priority for any television network like CNN or any of the others is eyeballs. They need eyeballs, they need ratings, they need profits. And that leads to a plethora of entertainment, you know, the entertainment aspects of television. And now with Trump in office and that all going on, <laughs> I have to turn it off. And uh, the fact that all those who predicted we'd fail are now in it and in this box, I don't know how we get out of it. Somebody asked me, well, how, what, would you, what would you say? Is there any way out of it? But there's no way out of it. I said, well, lack of viewership. That's one way out of it. People start stop watching. Uh, the, uh, it, it's, I, I'm old school, so you have a whole new deal going here. You are the future. There's people now saying, Maybe journalists aren't that relevant anymore. And the Packer that I just referred to is among others who said, that's absolutely not true. We need journalists now more than ever. And part of the, the solution being proposed by the Carnegie Corporation, the Knight Foundation, I don't know if you're following their work, but there's nonprofit news going on now. There are a lot of opportunities for you to do the work that needs to be done. I was talking to your uh, to uh, Celeste and Rogelio uh, when the freshmen were coming in, and I said, have you heard of the Carney and, uh, and uh, um, uh, the other, uh, the foundation? And their ideas are for knowledge journalism, which means their, their, their stated problem is that until now, it's the news outlets that have been setting the standards for the schools. Here's, the, here's what we need. Here's how you need to educate the journalists that we need. We've gotten to the point now where many journalists are resigning, they're quitting, because the pay level, not only do they fire photographers, but they fire journalists too. And the universities are the, are the answer. Now, I, I, I went, I told you I'm not a journalism grad, um, but I didn't need to be. I learned by doing. Uh, learn by doing isn't so valuable anymore. You're in a whole new world, complicated world, and I'm certain that you will save it for all of us uh, because it needs saving. Uh, democracy is very fragile, and uh, as Littman said, without a steady stream of relevant news, democracy is in trouble. So I'm just saying that uh, the schools, according to Carnegie, is uh, you must be aware of relevant history, current affairs, and critical thinking. Expertise in the specific subjects to be reported on. You might be interested in law or education or something. You have to be very up to speed on these things. Knowledge of the process of journalism, journalism awareness of the ethical standards, and mastery of the practical skills. There's been an emphasis on the mastery of the practical skills. I've been asked to talk, I, I was a councilman up in Oral Valley for the last eight years, vice mayor, constituents said, would you talk to my daughter? She wants to go, she wants to be a journalism, and she wants to be a journalist. So I talked to one, she met me at a coffee shop, I brought, a, brought along a book I gave her, 
forget what the book was, but she wanted to be a journalist. I said, well, what do you, what do you want to do? And she said, well, I don't, I don't want to go to some small town. I said, OK. Uh, I must say that she was, um, when I was back from this director, the pay was awful. It's better now. I don't know if you've heard of Patty Weiss, mm -hmm. but she was an anchor person at Channel 4 for 30 years when she left after she lost her election for Congress. And she was a maid of honor at my wedding, so I knew her well. When I came in, it was at her urging that I be hired as news director. I was astonished to learn she was making $10 an hour. Mm -hmm. And she was the number one anchor in yeah. Tucson. For so years. there's a lot of that going on. So beware. Um, I'm just saying now that the universities have to step up the game so that the news, so that the universities set the standards for the news outlets, not the other way around. Because right now, the news outlets, in my judgment, are failing. Okay. They're failing in many ways. That might be a good way to come to kind of segue. I'm kind of wondering, I don't know if you're all aware that CNN got a lot of criticism during the 2016 election for, how many of you disagree, for um, kind of giving a lot of publicity to Donald Trump because, as the boss said, Dana Sleep's quote, it was so good for ratings. And I'm wondering if you want to weigh in at all about the media's role in the 2016 election. And also, we're already talking about the 2020 one, so maybe you could talk a little bit about Well, CNN's new hire to head up their right. election coverage. Yeah, absolutely. The only other media-savvy president I have to relate that question to is Ronald Reagan who had media advisors par excellence, and I don't know, and Reagan was in the movies, he knew about image, he knew about all that. So when he was at Point du Hoc, I was over there covering the 50th anniversary of D-Day by doing five documentaries, and he was there talking about the Rangers, and they had flags flying, and the, they had all the video working with him, and he's giving his speech, but video trumps words on television, so he was presented as a glorious president on the hill. Trump is a media savvy guy too, and he just took over. And the media just went after it, like raw meat. Why do you think that is? Why? Because I had a in a private meeting, an editorial meeting at CNN, I had a producer, a vice president, say, our job is to scare them. I said, what? We need them to come back tomorrow. We need eyeballs. That's the whole thing. It's entertainment. Have you read the comment? I don't read the stories as much as I read the comment sections below the stories. <laughs> it's madness out there. Just madness. My wife said, uh, why do those guys even go to those rallies? I said, I've asked myself that same question. There was a BBC cameraman attacked by a Trump supporter in one of these rallies just last week. It's, uh, and it's more, it's just more of that. It's embarrassing, actually. You know, uh, he, he He's really good, picking a fight with Jim Acosta at CNN, picking a fight with, now he's picking a fight again with Maggie Hab Haberman of the New York Times. To call New York Times fake news, they make mistakes. All newspapers make mistakes. But now in the digital age, with the warp speed of information, and often the neglect to correct some of that warp speed information, that's another problem. And it's moving fast, moving fast. And Trump is a wizard at deflecting with the next shiny object. And the media just goes, whoop. OK, I, I can't fault them. I mean, but do it responsibly. Do it with probity. I mean, what is he doing? I mean, analyze that. There's always a way to tell a good story. It's all about good stories. Storytelling is the total answer. And that's something we try to emphasize. And I want to make sure, I, I'm going to get some people have some questions you might like to ask. Sure. Mr. Waters. 
Don't be shy. Come on. So, uh, hey, you got time? How'd you get your start here in uh, Tucson? Sorry? How, how did you get your start here in Tucson? I was invited down by a friend with a CP, which is called Construction Permit. He said, let's put this FM station on the air. I was out, coming out of radio, wiping up a 13-year radio career. And I did everything, news, weather, sports, whatever they had, talk radio. I was the number one disc jockey in Minneapolis at age 21, which was not a good thing. <laughs> it sort of almost ruined me. <laughs> but I'll bet you had a good time. I was in my hometown. I was born and raised in Minneapolis, and I'm working in the number 14 market in a new, it went from a jazz station to a rock and roll station. One of three owned by Crowell Collier. And then I wanted to work at the other Crowell Collier stations, one in San Francisco, one in LA, and I did both of those. And, uh, and then this just wrapped up my radio career, and we built the station and knocked off KTKT in less than six months. It was a, you know, a real need for that. And then my radio career was over. And I moved down. TV. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for coming to such an interesting um, talk. I'm a Janine Rally. I'm a faculty member here yes. in the school. Yes. Uh, and just uh, we'd love we'd love to hear about uh, sort of what your news diet is every day, like what you look at and, and pay attention to news wise, and then also uh, your favorite. What do you think? Maybe two examples of works that you think, or, or organizations that are doing really good work that you might point out mm -hmm. to the group? Well, I agree with Andrew McCabe. I don't know if you've been watching him over the last couple of days. But he said last night on uh, Jim Colbert, <laughs> The Late Show, that he thought the reporters, the news reporters at the newspapers, were doing an incredibly outstanding job. You don't hear that a lot these days. Of course, he was fired out of that miasma. Uh, but during the day, I tend to, uh, I don't watch CNN very much. Not since the day I saw John King standing on a corner after the bombing uh, of the, um, guess, the big bombing in the East. The, Boston, uh, the Boston Marathon. Boston Marathon, yes, thank you. He stood on a street corner with his cell phone. He's on camera and said, I've just received this from a source who tells me um, a brown-skinned man has been arrested or being detained, which was totally false, totally false. He never apologized, never, I mean, he just like went into hiding. That's not good. That's avoidable. That's preventable. I tend to watch now during the day in snippets certain people. Frank Viglucci, a former counterintelligence guy who, I think he lives here in Tucson. He's in the. He's got Tucson oh, in the background yes. just almost every other day. I've seen him as a guest. I watch right. him and I like NBC, uh, particularly because Andrew Lack is the news director. And I have a particular respect for him as a news director. Um, I think the Tucson Sentinel here is doing a great job. That's another thing. Uh, I'm good friends with Dylan Smith, and he asked me to be a part of that at one time, and I couldn't do it. But that's really, these are the opportunities ahead for you folks, because uh, everybody's at work on this. They, they realize, I'm, I'm old school, I, you know, you can listen to me. I'm mean, just a snarky old man. But uh, some of those people coming up are also pretty snarky about what's going on. And they have a certain uh, respect for democracy. And, you know, America, the threat to America is, is real, or it appears so. And uh, so I look to Dylan Smith, I look to local television, as a matter of fact, you may know this, is, is um, Americans have confidence in local television news by 
70 percent. It's that national news that's in the toilet. It's just, it's just awful. And but there is also a great number of Americans who still believe that it it can get back on track. They have confidence that it can be fixed. You're the fixers. Ask me a question, and I'll tell you no lie. <laughs> We probably have time for one more. Do you miss being an anchor? I'm sorry? Do you miss being an anchor? An anchor? Do you, Do you miss, miss being an No, I like being a reporter, but they always kept putting me back on the anchor desk. I think they like my hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I told, but because I was, I like being a, um, on the set as an anchor reporter. Like when the Challenger blew up, when the Persian Gulf War hit when Beijing exploded in Tiananmen Square. The school shootings, these things required no teleprompter. And, uh, but the most discomforting thing about it is you're on that anchor desk and you have an entire machine behind you. Writers, editors, uh, assignment people, uh, they're all working. It's, it's a, it's a mass project. It's not just one person sitting on an anchor desk being celebrated for being an anchor. It's an entire news organization. And we worked together really well because we didn't have celebrity or anything like that. People would come up and slip me notes and, you know, help, help me get the information I need because I'm sitting in a chair listening to somebody either talk in my ear or give me give me something. And uh, it was great. It was fantastic. I do miss that. I miss the people. And when CNN went the way it did after Fox came to be in 1996, right off of rightish wing radio and became a television medium that was fair and balanced, not so much, I didn't think, then things started changing. So CNN started being a little bit Fox and diminished CNN, you know, it's just, it's that competition, it's that we need eyeballs, we need, we need an audience every day, so we're going to say, we're going to do this conspiracy story today and see where that leads us. Maybe tomorrow we'll learn more because we're going to be talking to yada yada. It's a constant tease. And I'm not saying that rudely about them. I just know that that's what's done. We did teases too, but we we were more responsible in our teases. There's a conspiracy. Uh, the historian Richard Hofstadler say he's described what some call the paranoid style of America's information as the heated exaggeration, suspiciousness, and conspiratorial fantasy that infects the public debate. That's what's going on right now. But this has happened before. I don't know if you know about yellow journalism or if you ever talk about it in the late 1890s. Sensational headlines, very poorly researched news stories, sensationalism, muckracking. Pulitzer and Hearst fought it out in New York to the death. And uh, how do you do that? How do you fix that? You separate the uh, sales department from the news department. That was one of the things they did. But now, six corporations own all of the media in America. Did you know that? All of it. News, weather, sports, the movies, everything. CNN was going to be independent. Ted Turner had over 52% of the stock. He, got, he had to pick away in order to keep going until he was reduced to selling to Time Warner. Then he sold, then they sold to AOL for crying out loud. We're standing in the newsroom saying, what just happened? <laughs> AOL? <laughs> this Turner stock, Turner, Ted Turner had six a billion dollars in his personal account until the time it was sold to AOL. 
that stock went from 73 to 10. He lost $5 billion. He still had a billion. You know, <laughs> billion bigger, <laughs> billion bigger. Yeah, pretty soon you're talking real money. Yeah. Um, I think it's about out of time. Uh, you know, but I want to thank you all so much for coming. Oh. And I also want to thank all of you for coming. And uh, I just want to remind you, our next clock and teaser is March 13th. It'll be at 4 o'clock in this room. And that features our own Professor Kim Newman. And he's going to talk about, he's working on a personal project. And his grandfather was a famous artist in England. Kim is going back and he's photographing these same scenes that his father painted years ago. And it'll also give you a little